I'm Bob Reese, and this is Books in the World, a production of the Cape Cod Writer Center on Cape Cod, obviously, and I have the great pleasure of introducing today our guest, Dean Turner, who has written a book called Adrift in Memories. It's a memoir of his life, so I will start talking to you about how you came to write this. Um, thanks for coming. We I really appreciate your being here. Well, thank you for having me. Who inspired you to write this book, or what did? <laughs> okay. Uh, my dear wife, back in 2007, uh, after a, a, an evening of uh, friendship with a lot of people, the next morning she said, Dean, da Dallin, um, uh, why don't you write these stories down? Uh, our children and our grandchildren have no sense of the fascinating life that you've led. It wasn't more than a month later that we were up in Newburyport with my dear 96-year-old mother. And I asked Mom, I said, Ma, um, what is it that, uh, how do you explain, what, what is the answer to longevity? And she said, stay active. <laughs> and so I ended up taking both of those pieces of advice very much to heart, and I ended up uh, starting to write. And a few months later, I had a, um, uh, one of my articles published in the Cape Cod View magazine. It was a drift mm -hmm. in memories. Mm -hmm. And that was a shot in the arm. It was a very positive experience because people read it and they gave me feedback. Uh, so I was influenced by my mom and my uh, dear wife. But also, I att started attending the Cape Cod Writers Group uh, conferences, annual conferences in August, and I found the, uh, the seminar leaders, the, the, the spokesmen, uh, and many of my cohorts, aspiring authors, uh, had a great deal to share with me about the process of not only writing, but marketing and, and how you go about all this. So um, I was inspired and, and, uh, by a number of different people. It's interesting because the book took me 10 years, and halfway through the book I came to a c conclusion that, um, boy, if I'm going to take this kind of time to try and make it an excellent book, uh, I want to make it for a bigger audience than just my family. And so I remembered that many of the books that I most enjoyed in life were those where they had a takeaway, something that I could use afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so I injected what I call lessons learned into uh, the book at that time. At that, by that point, about nine years uh, into it, I had a hundred stories. But when I used these lessons learned uh, as a litmus test to decide which ones made the final cut, it went from about 100 to 54. Mm -hmm, right. Well, you mentioned the Cape Cod Writers uh, Conference. Yes. And that I, I just, I'm going to put in a plug for okay. the Cape Cod Writers Conference of this year, which will be August 1st through the 4th at the Cape Cod Resorts in Hyannis. So um, anyone who's interested in becoming a writer, uh, enhancing their writing skills, right. uh, or just being uh, there to network with other authors, right. um, I would urge you to come to the Cape Cod uh, Writers' Conference. Um, what is the book about? Obviously, you've mentioned it's about yeah. yourself and your right. life. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it's funny. It's, you look at the book, and people see the two covers, the front and the back cover, and they're sailing stories. And so people say, is it a sailing book? And I say, no, it's, it's actually more than that. Um, it's actually... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the lessons, it's a series of stories where I talk about lessons that I learned when I faced um, defining moments or forks in the road or ups and downs in my, my life journey. And I moved mm -hmm. 30 times uh, during my life so far. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> well, it, it has been quite an experience. But uh, I add this lessons learned um, primarily to inspire and to help others readers of all mm -hmm. ages. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you plan and map out this book? Uh, I mean, 30 yeah. moves, uh, that, that alone yeah. would be a good framework yeah. to, to yeah. go by, but maybe that's not how you did it. Well, actually, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I wasn't sure how I was going to approach it in the beginning, but what I did, and I've kept notes on highs and lows over my life, particularly my work career, so what I did was I generated a list of uh, 12 categories and the categories were, um, what were, um, what were my victories? What were my losses? What were my celebrations, my despair, my triumphs, my failures? 
what were my scariest moments, what were my funniest moments, saddest moments, happiest, most profound, and proudest. So I had 12 categories, mm -hmm. and um, I got great advice from a number of people. When I started out, I was primarily talking about all the good things that happened in my mm -hmm. life. Of course. And people said, well, mm -hmm. You better add some of the other things, too, because mm -hmm. people like reality. They like somebody that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's why there really were highs and lows. So I started out with these 12 categories, and I just generated memories of what were those items. What were my top moments and my, and my, my least happy moments? And so I, I stopped after I'd written this 100 stories, I ended up um, then going back and... Um, and I said, well, um, I, I used, the, as I said, the lessons learned as a litmus test to go mm -hmm. from 100 mm -hmm. to 54. But I then arranged them chronologically. And so uh, then I finally got down to the end point. Well, you really have a tremendously good memory to be able to do all of that. Um, one of the things that I was struck by reading the book was the fact that you were pretty transparent about both the highs and the lows yes. of your life. You were very honest yes. and forthright about what you were saying about these times in your life. And yeah. I appreciated that honesty uh, in your writing. Um, Thank you. What was the hardest part of writing the book? Yeah. Well, you're, you're, what you just said um, about my honesty leads to the answer on what was the hardest and what was the easiest. It, it uh, was uh, very uh, easy for me to write about all the high things, all mm -hmm. the positive sure. things, my accomplishments, what I felt proudest about. But when I get into the saddest and the, and the despair and the, um, the scariest and, and things that were not so pleasant, um, those were very difficult. But I, I, I felt that I had to represent what was real for me. Mm -hmm. and so. Uh, I think it, it felt, at the end point, I felt good that I was really sh sh being transparent and showing uh, mm -hmm. that life is, is not all, all highs. And, and it's how we deal with the, um, the tough points that are uh, the most learning, I think. Absolutely, and it's, um, every life has those ups and downs. There's nobody that gets through right. without having highs and lows. And um, for those who are fortunate, more highs than lows, That's I would right. say. That's right. um, what was the easiest part of this writing? Well, the easiest part, as I say, was uh, to talk about those wonderful moments, those accomplishments, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. triumphs, the victories, the uh, going from highs to lows, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, many were high and low within a given story, but some of them were absolutely negative and others were positive. But mm -hmm. so the easiest were the, were the fun ones. And what was the best? What was the, your favorite My section? favorite. Well, my favorite, I, you know, it's funny because um, I, I will answer that two different ways. Um, my personal favorite was when I identified those stories, and there were six of them, where it was both highs and lows. And I give you uh, an example of that. Um, my, the love of my life. And this is uh, the one time when I met my wonderful wife. Uh, we've been married now for 35 years. But then uh, the downside of that was in 2011, she had a catastrophic emergency, heart surgery, and I almost lost her. And mm. so mm. that was a vital story for me. A perfect storm. Um, I flunked retirement. This is one, uh, it's funny because I have talked with a number of different groups about the book. and. Um, some groups, like the, the men's clubs that I've talked with, they love this, I flunked retirement, because they're all of an age where they've been dealing with retirement, and how do you reinvent yourself? So, mm -hmm. But then when I talked, like last week at the Marblehead Yacht Club, they love all the sailing stories. Sure. And I talked yeah. to the women's clubs, and they like the, uh, look, the, you know, the, the love of your life, and they like the family reunions. Mm -hmm. And when I talk with the memoir group, uh, they want to hear, how did you write this? and how did you publish it? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was also, um, favorites are interacting with groups and addressing issues that are relevant to each group and they are all different. Yeah. Um, there were several sections that were pretty sentinel events in your life and I'd like to talk about uh, them a little bit uh, okay. one by one. Let me ask you about Ben Bradford. I uh, thought he was a wonderful character. Oh ben my Bradford. God. Yeah. And what, 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 
I know what he did, but tell the uh, viewers what he did. Well, Ben was a very charismatic fellow. He came into Gardner, Massachusetts as a new minister when I was, I think it was 17 years old. And uh, Ben stood about 6'8". He was an <laughs> artillery captain out of career. He was disillusioned by the war, and so he went back to the Union Theological Seminary, and his first church out of career was uh, the Gardner Congregational Church. Well, Ben not only was a wonderful, charismatic minister, but he loved teenagers, and he realized that one of the issues that <clears throat> everybody deals with, not just children, is um, one of the key fears is public speaking. And so mm -hmm. Ben, God bless him, ended up getting together a group of about 30 of us teenagers uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the church in, on a Sunday night, and he would get us one at a time up in front of each other to give spontaneous three-minute speeches. Well, under our breath, we would, we would uh, curse him because it was so embarrassing and so difficult. But halfway through this, um, <clears throat> You know, we came to realize that he's doing this for us, God bless him, and so let's take advantage of it. So we got comfortable uh, with public speaking, and uh, the title is, uh, if he, the, I wish he'd known uh, the difference that he made in the lives of others. So what, his, what this event did for many of us is it turned out people that were teachers and preachers and professional speakers. And whenever I've given deliveries, whether it's in the U.S. or overseas, I always say thanks, Ben. Well, and you've done a lot of that, haven't you? You've well, done I've been speaking, blessed. speaking, uh, reading uh, the the book. I could see you spoke in many, many different places, nationally, internationally, to different kinds of groups, and yes. always successfully. Well, I wouldn't say at least always by your successfully. account. <laughs> <laughs> Not always successfully, but had a lot of fun, and it's been it's been uh, it just I've been blessed with the opportunity to address a number of different audiences. Well, you must be pretty good at it, or well, they wouldn't be asking you back all the time. <laughs> uh, your best you. summer ever aboard Lord Jim. Oh, boy. What about that? Boy, that brings back good memories. That's the cover, the front cover of the book. And uh, the Lord Jim was an um, uh, uh, incredible 72-foot uh, yacht out of Marblehead, Boston's mm -hmm. Yacht Club. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a group of us at the Kappa Sig fraternity in Bowdoin were on a very snowy um, uh, Sunday afternoon after a Bacchanalia-type weekend. <laughs> we ended up uh, brainstorming, what are we going to do next summer? And so we were looking at working on a fishing trawler in Alaska or down to uh, the Grand Tetons in a whitewater rafting or working on a highway in Arizona. And, and people said, well, you worked on the Alice Wentworth in Camden. Why don't you go back there? You had such a good time. And I said, well, that, that was a wonderful boat, great experience, but it needed a gale force winds to drive it at 10 miles an hour, 10 knots an hour. And so I'm looking for a bigger boat, and I was you know, having to make money to get back to college each year. And so I ended up um, uh, getting an, an advice from my, my buddy, Roger Coe, who was a captain of the hockey team. He said, well, my father, they lived in Swampscott, knows um, of the people, the big sailors in Marblehead. And uh, I'll try and get a job ad, which will, um, which will end up uh, showing you. Uh, I just want to get that ad out if I could. So here's the ad that, that uh, he put in my hands, and I went down to Marblehead Yacht Club and interviewed for the job. Experienced big boat crewman needed for the summer of 58 aboard historic 72-foot topsail schooner Lord Jim. Captain Vieira needs two experienced deckhands to handle Commodore Ross Anderson's yacht. A room at the Boston Yacht Club with eating privileges, uniforms, and $500 a month are yours. $500 a month was big money mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. And so it's yours if you get uh, selected to work on the boat. So. I went down to the yacht club and, and the captain took me out on the boat and he grilled me from the top of the uh, mast down to the, uh, from the bowsprit down to the stern and all these questions about my sailing experience and then he took me down to the galley, gave me coffee and said, would you like to uh, join us? Uh, I got hired a fellow from Dartmouth uh, last week, we need two people. Well, I'd, I'd been brought up on the Bowdoin Career Counseling uh, uh, team to Whenever you get an offer, make sure you try and negotiate the best deal. Well, all I could squeak out is, when do you want me to start? I was so excited. So I yeah. worked on the boat, <clears throat> wonderful summer. One of the things that 
I'll never forget is it's the first time I ever experienced Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. So here I am sitting at the Hyannis Yacht Club, looking out at the Lord Jim that's on a mooring, eating lobster and hearing Patty Page singing Old Cape Cod, and I said, I've died and gone to heaven, I'm gonna come back. And my dear wife and I did come back in 2000. And- um, To stay. We've been hit, hit to stay, and yeah, we right. love it, and yeah. we're not moving. Well, that's good. Now, where do you live here? We live in the Stratford Ponds, in Mashpee. In Mashpee? Yeah. Okay, and I think this is really one of the parts that interested me the most, and maybe it interests you the most. It was the big turning point in your life. Ah. You know oh, what boy. I'm talking about. Oh, well, I do. There were actually, with 30 moves, there were several turning points. But I'll, I'll never forget the um, NTL, National Training Lab Conference, that um, we went to, that I went to when I was working with Kaiser in Oakland. Mm -hmm. This was a conference down in San Diego at a monastery. Um, and it was 100 organization development specialists. And um, we were there, we were all change agents. Our, our expertise was organization development. And we were there to learn some new technology on how to help organizations manage complex change. So they started out this program, um, getting us all spread into 10 person groups. And, um, and then they said, well, no, we know you're good at helping others, but we wonder how change is impacting you, mm -hmm. the change agents. And so they asked us to complete a form where we had to give our description of where we stood on a number of life variables now. And then at the end of the course, they said, we're gonna come back to that and find out where you wanna be 10 years from now and help you develop a personal action plan on how you get from A to B. So the, the types of things that, um, that um, they asked us to address were, uh, let me see if I can just find it here quickly to give you a sense of it. So they were asking, what's your salary and your financial status? What's your career satisfaction status? How about your family situation? How satisfied with you with the housing, the home you're living in? How, how do you feel about relationships you're having with others? Uh, and satisfaction with life so far? And finally, uh, what's your faith and spiritual health? So we addressed how were we feeling on those seven items right now in 1974. And then at the end of the, end of the session, we ended up coming back to that and completing how do we feel now, uh, how do we want to be, where do we want to be in these elements um, in 1984. Well, not, no, I was not a deserter. I'm not somebody that leaves organizations lightly, but um, it was within six months that I uh, launched a serious uh, new job search. And from that search, I, got ba I moved from the West Coast to the East Coast. I returned to Union Carbide. I got into international work. I finally found my dear wife, and um, I got to spend a lot more time with my, my family, my children, which I missed. And you so know, it was a wonderful, significant turning point. It, it must have been, oh. but a whole month. I'm interested in the process. Uh, how long did it take people to relax and sort of get into the program? Uh, you were there four weeks. How many of those four weeks were spent in sort of getting into the, the right mood to do this? Yeah. Good question. It, uh, we, we obviously took different amounts of times to adjust, but mm -hmm. they had they'd done this program countless times, and so they had a number of different exercises and things like team building and strategic business planning. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they'd set us up in teams to work on issues related to those topics. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and then we would give our report on results and what we came up with. But then we'd spend a lot of time talking about pr process of how did we feel? How did, how did, mm -hmm. so we got into some pretty heavy feedback on feelings. In <laughs> fact, <laughs> almost went overboard, but it was, it was a very engaging month. Yeah, it was yeah. incredible. There was a lot of that going on in that era, wasn't there, where companies were doing a lot of those kinds of Absolutely. Uh, retreats. Sensitivity uh, training and, right. and other things related to that. NTL were the masters mm -hmm. at this. And uh, so it was very, you know, you come out realizing that you've bonded so significantly with people in a new way mm -hmm. and you've got things to take back to rejuvenate what you were doing before the, you went to the right. session. So. Um, how about the sailing? Let's talk about the scary experience that one of your chapters ah. deals with. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I've had a few of those, but... I guess this one, the chapter is um, 
My Perfect Storm. Yes. And I don't know whether you've seen the movie, Perfect oh, yes. Storm. Oh, sure. Those 100-foot waves, I still think of them. But um, what happened, I was fortunate to be asked by my brother's friend, John Philbrook, out of Marblehead Yacht Club, who was a captain for a senior captain for American Airlines, to help him sail his 43-foot sloop Isole from Bermuda back to Marblehead amongst the tall ships in 1976. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that was a tremendous ex experience. We got about three days into it, and we're dead calm in the Sargosa Sea. It's total become. And so I had the ritual of saying prayers before our um, evening dinner. And so I said, Lord, bring us some wind. Mm -hmm. And boy, did he answer. <laughs> One of the learnings at the end of that chapter is, look out for what you ask for. <laughs> right. Because what happened was... Um, not long after that prayer, all of a sudden the wind came up, a dish fell off, and the winds went from, over the next six hours, they went from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 mile an hour mm -hmm. winds. Mm -hmm. And the seas built to 30 foot seas. So when you're in a, on an ocean liner uh, in 30 foot seas, you hardly notice it. But when you're in a 43 foot sailboat and the 30 foot seas are all around you, you really start to learn how to pray. And, and we were concerned that we weren't sure we were gonna make it home. It was that serious. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it went from being a very calm, wonderful experience to one of the scariest times of my life. I wasn't sure we were gonna be. Yeah, well, I could understand home. that. Oh boy, I've, but we made I've been, it. I've been on some cruises, but nothing, nothing like that yeah, ever. Yeah. Well, that, I never did before. And I hope to never again. <laughs> <laughs> I hope for all our sakes yeah. you're never doing that. Right. So what is your proudest accomplishment of all? Oh, boy, that's, that's tough. I've had many proud moments. Uh, I guess the two things that come to mind is, is, uh, is Manila and AT&T. In Manila, I was asked in 1979 to represent Union Carbide and uh, the United States at a world conference in Manila, in, in, uh, <clears throat> in, in Manila. And uh, what I did was I gave a plenary session on um, uh, survey results from implementing an integrated cross-cultural management system. Mm -hmm. I'd been working with carbide groups, divisions, all over Asia, India, South America. It was a global system. And uh, it was profound work because we were having to have not have them adopt our system in the different countries, but we had to work together to adapt them mm -hmm. to the nuances of the cultures of these different countries. So it was very rewarding. So the reason it was so, so fulfilling for me is I was not only representing Carbide, a big, major, wonderful corporation, but also the United States of America. And uh, mm -hmm. that was on AT&T, uh, and I, I think you only asked for one, but I'll sneak in a little. Sneak it in rather fast. Okay. We only have a few minutes left. <laughs> okay, terrific. <laughs> well, I'll just say we went from um, never having been used. I was with Lee Hecht Harrison, a very small boutique four office um, career management company. At the time, we'd never worked for AT&T. Well, we, I ended up leading a group that was hired by AT&T to help them downsize by 60,000 people over uh, mm. a five-year period. And so it was so gratifying because we were able to establish a win-win-win seamless partnership with our AT&T human resources uh, consultants, uh, mm -hmm. uh, people. And um, the most important part was that 90% of the people found new careers and new jobs. Well, that's pretty amazing. Which was, that, that it was is, very gratifying. Now, let me ask you about your book that you're working on. I know yes. you're working on another book. Yes. Well, thank you for asking. I'm working on a book that is entitled, I Flunked Retirement, The Secrets to What's Next. And the reason I'm so excited about it is um, right now the baby boomer population is right in the midst of retiring. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the mm -hmm. people f that are born from 46 to 64. And so there's 76 million of them. And right now they're retiring at the rate of 10,000 people a day. And so the reason I'm excited about the book is I've spent a lot of time with Lee Heck Harrison helping people reinvent themselves. And I'm convinced that within that major population, that broad audience, that there will be a number of people who will need help to decide how to, if they're fortunate to enjoy longevity and move, live mm -hmm. to their mid-90s, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. help them uh, learn how to reinvent themselves so they remain excited about their life. Well, being one of those, yeah. uh, I can say I'm not a baby boomer, I'm older than that, but I can tell you that most of the people that I know here on the Cape in retirement are extremely active. Yes. And uh, they may have flunked retirement, but they have been very, very active. And I think, I'm sure your book will yes. uh, talk about that. Oh, and yes. Well, that's the key. Good it's, luck with that. And thank you. Now, about publishing, yes. um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Okay. Um, tell me about how you got this one published. Okay. Well, it's a quick, quick answer. I had written two previous books um, in 99 and in 2001, and I went the traditional route of getting an agent and have the agent take the book to the ever-changing publishing industry. The long story short is uh, neither of those books got published, and the reason was they would say, well, Dean Turner? Who, who's Dean Turner? I was an unknown. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't want to invest in somebody that didn't have a marketing platform. So to answer your question, on, on this book, Adrift in Memories, I took a leap of faith and I went with a little uh, independent publishing organization called SDP. Mm -hmm. And they were terrific. Lisa Rakuzi Ross, the founder of that organization, has a wonderful national staff of editors and graphic artists and experts, people that know what they're doing. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. when it comes to the next book, I'm going to book, I'm probably going to go back to Lisa again. That's a very strong recommendation. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. Um, so what are your final thoughts in the last minute we have? Uh, do you have any final thoughts about this book or anything in general? Well, I guess um, my, my um, belief in... Um, a lot of people ask me, um, did you enjoy, enjoy doing this? Uh, I love the writing, but you know, I think I've enjoyed the marketing of the, the presenting of the material uh, and interacting with groups on it probably as much as I did the writing of it. Well, let me mention that the book once more. Yes. Your name is Dean Turner and the book is Adrift in Memories. And I think uh, we are about to sign off at this okay. point. But thank you so much for being uh, here. This has been a, a very interesting interview and I'm sure the book will sell mightily. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Okay. It's been a wonderful opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you.